Great. All right. Welcome, everyone. I hope you're excited. Uh, day two of the conference. I know there's so much great content uh, going on in all of the different tracks. So glad that you chose to join us today uh, for our session. Um, we're, as Anna mentioned, going to be talking about metrics, um, but we felt like calling our talk only um, observing Python applications was not super exciting. So our talk name is We Know What, you, what Your App Did Last Summer, Do You? Get prepared for some great movie uh, slides, and if you can guess where all the movies are, come to us at the end. There is no special prize particularly, but just the knowledge that you're a true movie buff. Yeah. Um, also, welcome to all the folks who are joining us online, and um, we hope that you are able to enjoy this as much as the folks here in the room today. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Vanessa Aguilar. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I guess I should preface this with, it's really nice to see everyone in person. This is my first in-person um, conference slash activity since the beginning of the pandemic, so I'm a little bit nervous, bear with me. Um, I also would love to talk to all of you afterwards. Just approach me, because I'm not really good at approaching people. So, um, but anyway, I used to be a front-end engineer, and that was about like four years ago is when that started at my company, which I'm currently at, which is Ecosia. Um, and then I slowly made the transition to become a site reliability engineer by participating in our on-call rotation. Um, and now I work as a full-time SRE, and I absolutely love it. I have no intention of going back. Um, but I'm really happy that I have the front-end experience because I really feel um, how much I'm able to leverage that uh, in my daily life working as an SRE. I'm also a dog mom. It's a very important thing about me. Um, I have a little pug named Connie. I love music. Um, I'm an avid scrobbler, and if you know what that means, come talk to me afterwards. Um, I also really love horror movies, and a lot of people seem to not like horror movies, which is strange. I really enjoy them. Um, otherwise, in my spare time, I also am organizing with the community. I uh, focus primarily on helping black, indigenous, and people of color in tech. Um, gain access to like resources, knowledge, and things of that sort. Cool. And I'm Jessica Green. Uh, my pronouns are also she, her. Um, I'm also a software engineer at Ecosia with Vanessa. I, I'm a self-taught community tour engineer, so I previously have worked as a coffee roaster, and before that I worked in um, film and television. I've actually been to a number of tech conferences, but asked the people that walk around handing you coffees. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to be at the other side of that. Um, I'm also involved in the community. I'm heavily involved in the Pi Ladies community. You may have seen me already at the stand. If you haven't been to our stand, feel free to come over and talk to us about what we're doing there. Um, and in my free time, I like to read, knit, and I'm a plant mum. I haven't quite got the commitment to be a dog mum yet, so. She's a dog aunt. <laughs> yeah, I'm dog an aunt, aunt to her dog. <laughs> cool. So, reference number one. Um, before we get into the bulk of our presentation today, we also just want to take a moment to highlight that observability is also a team effort. So Jessica and I work together as a backend engineer and myself as a site reliability engineer, and we're really in constant collaboration, um, ensuring that when incidents happen or when code is deployed into production, we are um, communicating with each other and making ourselves aware of potential yeah, things to know. Um, and you can elaborate a bit more on that. Yeah, so as an example, I've written a great Python application um, and I'm ready to deploy it. I put it out into production, but actually Vanessa is responsible for on-call. So when something happens with my application, it's up to her to know what's going on. I didn't do any observability uh, or, or instrument my application with any metrics, so unfortunately she has no idea what is happening and why there's a problem. Point being that hopefully after this tutorial, you will have some idea how to instrument your own Python applications, um, and you'll also be able to kind of have this respons shared responsibility of what happens to your applications when they're in production. We're gonna instrument my applications so that when Vanessa gets called up in three in the morning, she has some idea what's happening there and can understand better what's going on with the service. And in a perfect world, I actually don't get called at all because we're going to ensure that our monitoring makes us aware, potentially, of any situations that we'll run into. 
Cool, so before we get started, we just wanna highlight the agenda for you so that you're aware of what to expect. Um, we're gonna start by touching on what monitoring even is and why it's important. Um, and then we're gonna take you through a little um, exploration of the code, which is available in GitHub already. And then we're just gonna get right into the challenges. And uh, in between the challenges, there will also be breaks available for you to do as you please. Um, and yeah, let's get started. Perfect. Okay, so monitoring, what is it? Any ideas? I know at least a few people in the audience already have some familiarity with the term, so any brave souls willing to put their hand up? Yes, please, thank you. <laughs> So I just repeat, because uh, for the audience online, so getting metrics, getting some information, understanding uh, the processes for your services. This is, yeah, absolutely part of it. Maybe also alerting. Alerting also, so some kind of like system to know when things are happening, not that you have to go there and watch it the entire time. Any other ideas? Knowing what went wrong when there are some problems, absolutely. Also knowing what is happening even if there's not problems, maybe as well. Um, hopefully things are running smoothly and you might still be interested in the information. So for example, you might be interested in how many requests your application is getting or what's the average latency. You might not term that as an incident or that something is particularly wrong, but you might wanna get out that information. Okay, so now we've talked about why, what monitoring is. Now, can anyone take a guess why it even matters? Like, why do we care about having monitoring? Um, any, any guesses, any answers? Why does it matter? Yeah, you there. Okay, so uh, they said um, to see problems before our customers see it. Anyone else? Okay. Okay, so to repeat, um, when your customers are already seeing the problem, then you're in deep water essentially, and we shouldn't get to that point. Any last guesses? Yeah? For improved stability. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so all of those answers are great, um, and none of them are wrong. It's important to have monitoring so that we are being proactive rather than reactive to when situations are going to occur with our services or applications. Um, and also to be able to like get ahead of any issues that might be occurring in general and get into the, get into the rhythm of understanding how our operations are functioning on a regular basis and being able to spot any anomalies. And also, hopefully, the people online, you're like writing in the chat your ideas around this. Uh, unfortunately, it's a little hard to interact with that, but um, we hope everybody, yeah. We're making you work for this tutorial. I apologize, uh, but that's what you get. <laughs> so we've heard about the what, we've heard about the why, now about the how. So we're gonna talk in this uh, about Pr Prometheus. It's not the only solution out there, um, but that's the one that we're working with professionally and the one that we have the most uh, interaction with. It's also a great project to follow. They have a lot of documentation and they have the community around it. But how does Prometheus actually work? So we've talked a lot about your app kind of needs some metrics, but what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, we're gonna go into actually adding the metrics. We use the term instrumenting your application. But what's important is that they actually are exposed. So you need a web server that's running for your application that is exposing those metrics. Convention is forward slash metrics. Doesn't have to be that endpoint, but that's the one that's like the default configuration. You can do a lot of different things with configuration with Prometheus. And you need to know that um, your Prometheus is gonna actually actively scrape the application. So your application isn't pushing these metrics out. It's just saying, hey, there's metrics at this endpoint. If you want them, we'll be able to also see them. 
Prometheus's job is to actively go and a regular cadence, which you configure, scrape those metrics from your application. So it's a two-part thing. The first part we'll look at is uh, this instrumenting, which means exposing the metrics at this endpoint. And the second half will be about setting up Prometheus so it can scrape those metrics. We'll also look at Grafana, hopefully. We don't run out of time. Um, and Grafana is a secondary tool that you can use for dashboard making and for querying your metrics and kind of you need something that you can glance at, especially if you're on call and it's like two in the morning. You don't want to be like hunting through a, a web page saying like, oh, OK, where's, where's the error? You need something that's like right in your face. And Grafana is a really great tool for setting up dashboards for this. Great. So we're going to switch now. And we'll just leave the slide up a second. This is the repository for the workshop. Um, we can maybe also show you it larger um, because we're going to switch over to code anyway. But this is the GitHub repository that you need to follow along. In there, we do have a readme that also documents everything that we're saying in text format. So if you're somebody who prefers to follow along at their own pace or prefers something in text format, we have that there. Um, and also, if you, uh, for example, don't have your laptop with you today, but you want to follow it through later, you can do so. Um, it's also important to note that part of the GitHub repository, um, there includes the solutions. So we have solution branches. So today we'll go through a few exercises. And if you are not able to um, accomplish it today, you'll have the answers available to you so that you're able to do it in your own time. OK, so shall I put this up there? Everyone good with the link? Perfect. Cool. We just keep this here. Oh, no, no, we should uh, switch over. OK. I'm going to attempt to move this here. Yeah. OK, perfect. Looks, looks good. All right. You might have to help us with telling us if the font size is OK. And maybe if folks online can't see it, they can let you know in Slido. Try and increase this a little bit. Is it legible for you all? Perfect. OK, cool. Thank you very much. OK, so you might have to stand yeah, I'll stand here. Yeah, I'll OK, so in the repository, you'll see a number of things at the root level. Um, we're not going to touch through all of them now. Most important would be the readme. As I mentioned, it gives you a text breakdown of the different challenges and the things that we're going to run through today, um, including some links out to different documentation for Prometheus. Um, then if we scroll up and we go, we'll see a, direct, a directory called app. I'm also trying to. Oh, yeah, see that. Yeah, sorry. Um, so inside here is like the application that we're going to instrument. So we were really trying to find something that would be like the smallest slice of a Python application um, that we could instrument. And the idea here is that you would really be able to like swap this out with your own application that is probably a little bit more complex. Um, how's, how's this font size at the back? A bit bigger? Cool. Um, so this application is a HTTP server. And it has one endpoint, which is tree counter. Um, and under the hood, what this server is doing is um, calling out to the Ecosia API for the tree counter. This is a global tree counter that tells you how many trees have been planted by Ecosia users since it began. So I don't know the exact number because it's always going up, but it's somewhere over 140 uh, million. Uh, and the thing is, our applications are pretty stable because the SRE team do such a great job. Um, but that's kind of boring when you want to create some metrics and dashboards, because then everything is just part of the, like, the same thing. So what we have added in here is an artificial 503. That means that for every so often when you uh, request this uh, service, it will uh, return a 503 in the back end. The front end side of this is a very simple web page. Um, actually, it was great that Vanessa has this front end uh, back e uh, background because previously it was like pretty ugly because me as a back end person had just kind of hashed it together and then she made it look beautiful. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's OK. Yeah, it's OK, not beautiful, beautiful, just better. Um, <laughs> so if we jump into the terminal 
and we run this code. We have set up some make commands. Uh, if you're on Windows, unfortunately, make doesn't work. But if you look inside the make file, you will find the raw command that we're using. So then you can just directly run this command. <coughs> if you're on Linux or Mac, make should not be a problem. Um, but if it is, you can let us know. Um, if you see some errors, we also, it's, uh, I think it's saying the address is already in use, so try the LSOF. LSOF, all one word, and then minus I, and then. So yeah, we made like a small error handling um, section in the bottom of the readme in case you do find any errors. We are aware that um, some things come up. For example, one common thing we see is either the port's already in use, so you maybe have something else running, or uh, it could be to do with the Python version. Um, we base this on 3.10. Yeah. What the hell? So we are currently hitting one of those issues, so that's why live demos are always, always good fun. You know what we can just do is just change the port. We'll try and do this. Five forty seven. This is a good time if you have if you've gone to that repo and you want to clone it um, and okay. get that code. I'll try and make that again now. Perfect. I would just uh, just ignore that for now. We can look at it in the break. Okay. So it will run a web server at 801, port 801. And then when you visit it in the browser, you will see something like this, hopefully. So yeah, 147 million. That's not far off. It doesn't take, yeah. just when you refresh it. Um, and if we refresh the page a couple of times, you'll see this number going up. So that's all the trees being planted in the world, uh, helping to pull out some of the carbon. Oh, wait, what's that? Zero? Did we unplant all the trees? What happened to our trees? Okay, don't panic. That's the 503, okay? So when you see the zero, the user is seeing a zero, they're seeing false information, but what's happening in the back end there is the artificial 503, which could be the service just returned a, like a server error. It's not available. That's why we're gonna instrument this application. The problem we wanna solve is that sometimes our application is returning the wrong thing to our users. We wanna know when, how often that's happening. Okay, so now we're gonna go into uh, the GitHub repository and show you how we can add Prometheus to our application. Okay, so do we want to show the slide? So now we want to show the diff between. After this, we will have the challenge period where it will be over to you, and we can also come and help you if you have are hitting any blockers or questions. Can you check this is section one branch? Yes. Okay. Okay. So the first thing that we're going to want to do to instrument our application is in our um, app directory inside the main file we're gonna add the Prometheus client library. So Prometheus client have the, their own metrics handler, and what's really nice is we can use it as the base class for our HTTP handler class. Um, so we first import it, uh, and then we, if we scroll down to, uh, slightly to the class, sorry, if I stand here, can you see the screen still? Um, okay, and here on line 27, you'll see 
we are using the metrics handler as the base for our HTTP request handler. And if we scroll down a little bit more, you'll also see on line 44, we're adding an endpoint forward slash metrics, which then is returning the super of the HTTP request handler. This is the only three things that we have to do, four lines, I guess, to be specific. Um, and this is going to add Prometheus to our server uh, and allow us to be able to expose metrics on the forward slash metrics endpoint. Um, if we stop and restart the server, very important because it's not on auto load. So if you don't stop and start it, you won't see the changes. Mm -hmm. We want to restart it now? Yep. And then we should hopefully still see our web server. If we maybe refresh it, we hopefully also see the number of trees of back, yay. Uh, and, but now if we change to the endpoint forward slash metrics. Uh, we have to be on yeah, that branch, on this branch. Yeah. One second. Oh, that's nice. I haven't used that UI interface. Okay. What? That's not it. Ah, uh, you just don't have the update version. That's how the front end used to look. <laughs> so, not so, not so uh, inclusive because the font is incredibly difficult to read. It felt like a good decision at the time. Am I merging in main? I'm just going to the forward slash metrics endpoint. Oh, yeah. Because the metrics are the same. It doesn't matter if the front end doesn't yeah, look correct. That's true. Can you, you're going to have to help me here. Yeah, keep going. Delete, 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 delete. One more. Metrics. Oh, oh it's because I stopped the server. Ah, OK. All right. Perfect. And maybe zoom in slightly? Yeah. So folks can see? We already have metrics. We're done. We can go for lunch already. <laughs> uh, so all we did was four lines, right? An import, an endpoint, switched out the base class. Um, and we already have metrics that are being exposed. And if we had Pr Prometheus configured, we already know that it would be able to scrape our application and be able to read these metrics. So these metrics are the base metrics. Um, so we didn't have to do any additional work to get them. Did you want to say something here? Or do you want me to just keep going? Um, so you, what you can see here is it's mainly around CPU processes uh, and also like garbage collection. An interesting, I'm, I'm sorry for the folks back home, I hope that you can still see when I'm pointing over like this, but uh, the interesting thing you'll see, for example, for the garbage collection total is that there's three or there's yeah, three generations, um, and this is a label. And we're going to jump into how we can use labels to split out and make more granular information from our metrics. This is good, um, and this is going to be challenge one. So if you've been programming along with us, um, you might already have this running, but we're going to also give you maybe like five minutes to see how folks are doing. Uh, maybe there were some problems with the setup. And after that, we're going to look into how we can have a little bit more control and how we can um, do our own custom metrics. So if you did not already, please go um, and download this, uh, clone this repository. Ensure that you have the requirements installed. Open up. Don't go to the solution branch immediately. Try, write the code out yourselves. Um, if you check in the readme, there's also, it's plenty documented there. You need to import the Python cl client and use the Prometheus handler as the base, and then see if you can get metrics up. So it's 11.15 now. We're also happy to take any questions or come around and uh, support any folks who need help with the setup at 11.20. We're going to jump on to the next part of this. OK, there's about 
Oh, actually, no, it's already 11.20. If you haven't got everything up and running, we have another challenge section coming up, and we planned a small break. So don't worry. We will be able to help you, or your neighbor will be able to help you get things running. Cool. So we move on? Mm -hmm. All righty. All right. So we are moving on now. So the next topic that we're going to touch on is defining custom metrics. And so in the previous few sections, we just talked about uh, some of the base metrics that you get access to when you start using the Prometheus library. Um, but sometimes the metrics that we get out of the box um, aren't sufficient for us, right? Um, Prometheus does a really good job of providing tools that should be applicable to several applications. But naturally, each application is different and has different requirements. Um, so we are able to create our own custom metrics. So to define a metric, there are a few things that we need to do. Firstly, we're going to start by uh, defining a data type. So in the examples that we're going through, we're using the data type counter. So um, here, we can see that we have defined data, the data type for our custom metric as counter. Um, we also need to declare a base name. So in this case, we've called the base name request total. And it's really important for everyone to understand that you are able to call this whatever you want. So you could, for example, call it apple, apples and bananas. But that wouldn't make sense, right? Because when we're actually looking at that information, it wouldn't tell us anything. So when we're going through and choosing naming, we want to make sure that we're selecting things that make sense to us and are going to be informative, especially when we're waking up in the middle of the night or when whoever is on call um, has to look through this information. So the base name here that we've chosen is request total. The description that we've written here is requests. Theoretically, we would be a little bit more specific here, but just for the example's sake. And then we're also able to add some labels. And here we've added two labels, which is status and endpoint. So when you are actually going to start calling um, the metric to actually make use of it, uh, we want to make sure that where we are placing this metric and where we're calling it is intentful, right? Because we're able to place it throughout various parts of our application. And I won't go too much into detail because this will be part of your next challenge. Um, but be aware that where you are positioning the metric and where you're calling it is going to return information specific to that location. So be aware of that as well. So we've gone through now and talked a little bit about how we actually create a custom metric. Um, and Jessica has pre previously shown you at the endpoint slash metrics this like huge list of information. And we also want to show you what our custom metric will actually look like. So when we're at the endpoint slash metrics, the information that we'll see given back to us is requests um, here we see the description that we set previously a couple slides ago, which is requests. We see the type that we set, which we set to counter. The base name, which we decided not to call apples and bananas, instead request total. And then the labels that we've added, endpoint and status. And then just the last one was the number, the 1.0. Oh, yeah. And we can also see how many times we've actually called it. So in this case, it will increment because it's a counter. Counters only go up. In this case, the first time that we load the page, the main page, the index page, it'll be one. And then the next time, it'll be two and three, unless you actually specify that you want each increment to be in increments of two, which you wouldn't usually do, but you're able to if you would like to. OK, so now we've already gotten to challenge two. All right, so now that we've gone through the process of how you actually define your own custom metric, we'd like you to go ahead and um, do this in your code. So we're going to be adding a custom counter metric, which we just, we've just gone through. And it's going to count the requests and one of the labels will be status code. 
Um, and in order to actually see the counter taking effect, you're going to have to rerun the server um, and then continue to refresh the actual page a few times on slash tree counter to actually see it going up by one in this case. And then you're also then going to want to check slash metrics simultaneously and refresh slash metrics so that you can see the counter going up as you go. And the one extra hint here is, as Vanessa already mentioned, where you place the increment call, so where you're incrementing your metric, makes a difference. It's a bit of a philosophical question. Um, so maybe try, add it in a couple of different places and think about what result you're seeing. Particularly, the big hint here is particularly think around that 503 uh, and who sees that. And something to be aware of as well, if you're copying the same custom metric and placing it in different places, then you're going to see the same information given back to you. And that might be a little confusing. So you might want to alter the base name for yourself a little bit so that you're able to keep track in the sea of text. Or use your labels. Yeah. So the labels there give you the granularity. So if you have one that has a label name that says, OK, this is the metric for the user facing endpoint, then you could have another one that has a label for the upstream call to the upstream API. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. So the question, I just repeat the question because of the folks online. So the question was, there is another metrics that, that appears um, and it is a float and um, it was called request counter. Is that what you said? Um, or request? Request created. Request created. Um, and this is a gauge, which uh, is a different uh, data type. Um, and this is a thing is like sometimes you create one metric, but Prometheus will already preempt that you might want to also for that type. Uh, use this other type. So for example, also when we, uh, in our bonus material, we look at latency and we look at like recording the time that request took, um, but you also for free, I mean for free, out of the box, get a counter. Uh, so this is just Prometheus preempting that you might want to actually be able to use this information further down the line when you're querying it. Thanks for bringing that up actually, that's a good point. So you're back, hopefully refreshed. Now for something completely different. So now we're going to start talking about scraping the metrics, and we're going to talk about creating dashboards. We're still pretty good on time, so hopefully we'll get to cover most of this material. Um, but if we don't, like I said, it's already documented in the readme. So we're now going to use the, the Docker Compose um, for running all of this because we've already configured Prometheus and Grafana and the application to run within Docker so they can easily network with each other. Um, and you'll be able to see some of the configuration that we have that for that in the root of the uh, application repo. We essentially have th three things running at three different ports. So Prometheus will run at port 9090, our application will still be at the same port, 801. Do make sure that you stopped running the server that you already had running, otherwise you'll get a port conflict. And Grafana will run at 3000. Grafana requires a login, and the login information is in the readme, but it's also in the Grafana um, configuration YAML. So in this case, I think it's Ecosia and Workshop. Of course, you should configure it to be something safe if you're, <laughs> if you're uh, deploying this somewhere. Um, and yeah, it's this one command, docker compose up, should get all of this running for you. So don't worry, we do have planned in time to support you with this. So just stick with us for now while we show you what we're going to do, and then it's over to you, and we'll come around and help anyone that's having any problems. Is the size of this OK at the back? Yeah? Uh, OK, so now we're looking at the Prometheus interface. Um, and 
to be honest, normally when we're looking at our metrics, we're mainly looking in Grafana and doing the querying there. Um, but I think it's good to know that you can also do this in the Prometheus UI. And it's also a good place to start like playing around with the queries in the PromQL language. Um, so you'll see uh, up at the top, the status tab. Sorry, Vanessa. And if you go down to targets, it's the one before the bottom. Uh, here you'll be able to see the different things that Prometheus has been set up to scrape. So you'll see that we have our application and you'll see that it's scraping at the forward slash metrics endpoint. This has been configured in the YAML files that you'll find in the repository route. You'll also see that Prometheus scrapes itself. So you also have metrics in there about Prometheus. So it also has the endpoint metrics when it's running and you can also look at Prometheus, uh, Prometheus's own metrics to see how Prometheus is doing. So if we go back now to uh, the main page, you'll see we're able to put an expression in here using the PromQL. And the first thing we're gonna put in here is just the name of our metric, which is request total. Um, when we first execute this, you'll see that it's, there's nothing coming up. That's because the number is zero. So we will first need to actually go to the uh, tree counter endpoint and refresh that page a couple of times. Sorry. Yeah. One more, and now tree counter. Yeah. Okay, so if we just refresh here a couple of times, and then we go back to our Prometheus UI, and we execute it, now we can see that we are actually nice. getting a response. And you'll see it's not just one line here, we actually got three. This is because, as we alluded to, we added a couple of different um, places in the code where we incremented, and we added different labels to be able to distinguish them. So what you'll see here is we have the tree counter endpoint, that's the user-facing endpoint. Um, it actually always has a state as 200 in the application that we wrote. Um, and then we also have the upstream endpoint. That's the one that's calling the upstream API, which is the Ocosia tree counter API. Uh, and that has two values. So that most of the time will have this 200, but some of the time it's returning this artificial 503. So you'll see that add up. So the first one has a value of two, but from that two, one of them was the, uh, had this 200 result from the upstream and one had the 503 from the upstream. We can use Prometheus to drill down a little bit deeper if we're really just interested potentially in the status 200. And here you can see now we, just, we don't see that 503 anymore. We're just seeing um, what, what returned a 200 status code. And we could also go even further and say, oh, we're only interested in the specific endpoint. So just show us the metrics that are relevant for that endpoint. So this is as far as we're gonna go um, with the uh, Prometheus UI. You'll see there's other things up there like alerts. You can actually get some like uh, graphs showing here and like kind of look at it in different view. But to be honest, Grafana just does such a great job of that. I personally don't normally do it in, in Prometheus. And we're gonna jump over and show you how we can do this uh, by creating dashboards in Grafana. Okay, so. so we'll take a minute for folks to just, uh, I know there's a few problems maybe with Docker Compose running, but your challenge now is to get this running with Docker Compose, query the metrics in the PromQL, um, and yeah, kind of like play around a little bit. See if you can find that the target is being um, scraped. You can have a look at the graphs. You can have a look into the alerts. We're just gonna give you like maybe four minutes just to double check this is running because we'll go into more detail with Grafana.
Okay, so someone has just kindly helped online and they have said that if you're on Mac and you're having some problems with poetry, deactivate your firewall okay, um, and this might help alleviate those problems. So thank you to that person. <laughs> You have to, so if you look inside the uh, YAML files at the root, you have to configure to tell um, Prometheus what it, where it should be looking, like which ports it should look for this uh, forward slash metrics. I think it just takes forward slash metrics at default, so you don't specifically have to configure that. Uh, at where we're working, um, we, we have it kind of set up with uh, JSON it for being able to deploy our applications. Um, and we have some sort of flag there that is like sc let um, Prometheus scrape this. Um, so you could definitely have a more com uh, complex configuration for some sort of switching it on. In terms of like, absolutely, you just say look for anything that has forward slash metrics. I'm, I'm not sure. Does it answer your question? Um, I'm not sure if I repeated the question, but the question was about can you set up a um, automated finder for looking for anything that has forward slash metrics exposed? Question is, I need to expose my metrics, a forward slash metrics, uh, for Prometheus to be able to pick it up. But what if I don't want everybody else on the internet to be able to look at that? which, yeah, you probably probably don't. It can, it can give away quite a bit of information, I guess. Um, good, great question, because also something that we actually had to solve as well recently at work. We've had that. Yeah, so essentially the way that we've encountered that was that our, co our applications are all running within Kubernetes, um, and we are using CloudFront, right? Cloudflare. Cloudflare, sorry, um, for controlling like what traffic can go where. So essentially, we had to configure it to say like only within the cluster, or only like these applications can communicate with each other. Um, so you would need some extra layer on top to make sure that's the case. Um, but yeah, at one point they were exposed, and that was not good. <laughs> that was a long time ago, though. To be fair, to be fair. Yeah, like yeah. Three years ago. <laughs> But, you know, we all make mistakes, and that's yeah. how we learn, right? So. All right. Um, so we're going to move on to the next challenge. And the next challenge is challenge four, in which we're actually going to be building a dashboard using all the data that we have. So we're almost at the end, um, but I really want to take a moment to sum up the journey that we've just gone through. So we've gone through talking about um, what metrics are, how we actually create custom metrics, if we want to utilize the base metrics that we get. And then we actually went into the Prometheus um, UI to actually try and interact with those metrics. But now, realistically, um, as an application developer, the end-ish step in this journey is to now use those metrics and that information to create a Grafana dashboard, which is actually going to be useful to you in that you're going to be able to look at it on a daily basis and assess um, how many requests you're getting? Are you getting an abnormal amount of requests? Are there is there an abnormal number of errors? Are there errors in general? Um, and so for this example, we're going to go and actually create a panel inside of Grafana. So make sure that you actually have the application running. Oh. Is everyone okay? Okay. So make sure you actually have the application running, and then you're going to be able to access the Grafana UI on port 3000. So go to localhost 3000. And then if you haven't logged in already, you're required to use a username and password, which are available to you in the README. Kay. So I'm going to attempt to simultaneously <laughs> try and do stuff uh, from this amazing angle. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. So we're going to want to create a panel. So you're going to click up here where it says Add Panel. I hope you all can see. And then we're actually going to do Add a Panel, Create a Panel, I believe is what it says from this angle. Add a new panel, yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, Ooh, this is a lot harder than I expected. Can, Can you, you see this at the back? Yeah, cool. Okay, so now that we've actually created a panel, we want to make sure that we're actually selecting the visualization that we want. So we're not going to use time series, right? Grafana is great in that it gives you a ton of options to be able to manipulate the data and visualize it in whatever way that you want. But remember, we're working with counters. So we don't want time series, we want stat. So go up here and then select stat. And it shows no data at the moment because we actually haven't given it any information. So this is correct. So far, so good. OK, and now, as we were doing in the Prometheus Query Manager, we yeah. want to actually look for requests total. Jess, I'm going to need you to help me out yep, here. Yeah, you're good. You. All right, cool. And it also actually auto-completes for you, which is really, really lovely when you're in situations like me where you're looking at it from a difficult angle. OK, so now we're going to look for information for request total. And we want to look at status 200. Did it add quotations on both sides? Yep. OK, cool. Yeah, looks good. And ta-da! We have our first piece of information. Woo-woo! So. I have a dashboard. Yeah, this is it. panel number one. Now we're actually being shown requests total that have received a status of 200, but we want to get more specific, right? Because we have several places in which we've positioned this, and we want to make sure our data is more granular. So in addition to just looking for a status 200, we also want to look for a specific endpoint. Yeah. And uh, yes. we are going to look at, in this case, the tree counter endpoint. Looks good. Ooh. I think you have to, yeah. And as you can see now, it reduces the amount of information that we see. So what this is telling us is we are now looking at the number of the number of requests which have received a 200 at the endpoint tree counter. Amazing. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. Like great work. Um, I think also what you can see in the background here is like this a line with the uh, like shaded underneath. And this is also kind of like showing you now the time series of when this is happening. You can remove that. Um, you have options in the right hand side here where you can kind of like give your panel a title. You can like add what data type it is. You can remove a little bit how it looks. Um, so you can also add in alerts in Grafana as well. So it can also be a tool to help you set up your alerting so you have the more observability set up. Um, yeah, so this is kind of like the bulk of what our workshop is about. You now have an application running that has a number of base metrics and your custom metric. So you could really create like an absolutely beautiful dashboard with all of that information. Hopefully it's also been clear enough for how you would be able to now apply that to like something that you have running yourselves and you have a bit of the configuration for Prometheus and for Grafana. So if there are things that you wanna run locally or deploy, you should be able to also do so. Um, I also wanna take a moment to elaborate a little bit on the types of information and how this can be useful to you practically, right? Because this entire workshop has been like from the very building blocks, how you actually instrument your application and how you go through and work with Prometheus and Grafana. But in a real world setting, a piece of information that would be really helpful to you, for example, as Jess mentioned earlier, your applications are exposing their metrics and Prometheus is scraping them. But we don't have infinite amount of storage, amount of space, right? That information that Prometheus is scraping needs to be stored somewhere. So what can happen is that if your application, if there's an error in your application and there are a ton of errors that are being thrown, Prometheus is constantly scraping them, eventually what's going to happen is Prometheus, the storage, is going to fill up and it'll likely crash. And this is something that's happened to us in the past. And how you would utilize Grafana to help you preemptively get ahead of this issue, for example, is by monitoring the, the storage of wherever like the persistent volume that Prometheus is using for storage. So that would be really, really helpful because you'd see the total amount of storage that Prometheus has available, and then you'd be able to see on a regular basis in whatever cadence you'd like how much storage is being used. And for, for example, 
with us, there was an application that had a really high uh, cardinality for one of for itself, and um, as a result, before we had this information available to us in Grafana, we had no way of of seeing this. And so, what happened is that it took our Grafana instance completely down because it exhausted the storage. So then we went back and created a panel that were, that essentially visualized for us how much storage Prometheus had available to us at all times, and. If you go and explore the Prometheus documentation, there are a lot of really, really helpful functions. For example, there's one that exists that is able to intelligently guess when an application will fill the storage up. And so you don't have to rely entirely on just looking at the when the storage is filled. Because realistically, by the time the graph shows you that Prometheus is about to get filled, you don't know the rate at which that happened. So by the time you actually notice on your graph, it could be that it's minutes away from filling up and essentially not functioning anymore. Yeah. Cool. So we have about 10 minutes left. So if we jump back to our slides, I'm oh. quite sure, sorry. Um, what we'll do is we'll um, kind of just skip over channel, channel, challenge four uh, and leave that to the end, just in case um, folks still want to do that. But we'll move on now to the Q&A section. So now is the option for if you have any questions for anything that we've covered or anything else, uh, we'll try our best <laughs> to answer those questions. And priority is given to Slido, so Anna's going to come over and ask us the questions that have been raised there first. You can already write in questions into Slido. If there's none in Slido, then we can ask also in the room. So maybe just stand here, say yours. Okay. I believe it's on or not sure. Oh, I think it's on. AV, could you please make sure the, the mic, mic is on? Is on? Thank you. Cool. So the first question on Slido is uh, what impact on app performance does Prometheus do when scraping metrics? Does does it change any like performance at all or so um, the app is needing to expose the metrics. So in terms of the impact on the performance of the application, it's that you're gonna have to have this uh, server running. So if your application does not already have a HTTP server running, for instance, we also have some gRPC services. Um, what we then have to do is run a metric specific server. So I guess that would be an added um, impact on performance. But Prometheus itself, I mean, yeah, you have to, you're gonna have another dependency, I guess, but it's not gonna otherwise really um, take up any performance issues? Is there anything you can think of? For the application or for Prometheus? For Prometheus affecting the application performance. Not for Prometheus no. affecting the application, no. yeah. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is, uh, what impact on, no, okay, <laughs> that was already answered, sorry. Can we also use Prometheus uh, for non-web apps? Uh, for example, can we measure database accesses and stuff like this? Yeah, it's a great question. I can think of uh, one use case that we have. So we have a number of jobs actually written in Python that do like data loading. So they do some sort of like ETL pipeline essentially where we take some data, we do some maybe transformation and we pop it into some sort of storage solution. Um, those are ran then as cron jobs. So they're not long running applications, right? They don't have a server that's constantly running. The solution that we use for this is a Prometheus push gateway. That means that you have to have the gateway running the whole time. Uh, so it has a server running for the gateway, but your job has to push the metrics. So at the start, we kind of explain like, oh, Prometheus is scraping the metrics. You don't need to do any pushing. But in this scenario, you do have to push the metrics somewhere because your job is short lived. So the scraping, if the scraping didn't happen coincidentally at the right time, they would be lost. Um, so you can use it for things that are not like a HTTP server. As I just mentioned, you could also maybe have an application that's running a different protocol, um, but you will need somewhere uh, a metric server running to be able to collect that data. 
Uh, thank you. And so next question is, um, not sure, but like, yeah. Can Prometheus scrape metrics periodically or brackets automatically? Yeah. Yeah, you can set it up to scrape as often as you would like. Um, yeah, and that really just depends on your personal preference. Mm -hmm. So, um, would you get a vendor lock when using Prometheus? How easy it would be to switch to another metric system? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, you good for me to take this one? Okay. So, uh, what, what we try to do is isolate out the metrics code to like its own library or package uh, that we um, kind of within there have all of the Prometheus specific stuff happening and then we import it into the application. So, I think that's generally a good pattern for trying to avoid um, having a third party library throughout your code uh, and make it easier to switch it out. Um, to be honest, Prometheus is the only solution that I've used, so I haven't really Same. thought too much about needing to switch. I'm very happy with it, so maybe that's a good promotion for Prometheus. Do you have anything to add, Vanessa, or like? Yeah. No, it's also okay. the only option that I've used, yeah. Uh, so then let's cover it. And the last question at the moment on slide is, can Grafana dashboards be created with scripts? Can Grafana dashboards be created with scripts? Yeah, like I believe like not like when you interact with um, so Oops. user interface, but somehow on the... So you can create them using code. Um, you can also codify your Grafana dashboards. I've personally never done this before? Have you ever done this? I, I also don't know how I would feel about doing that. Necessarily. Yeah, yeah. I have feels about this. I'm just going to share. Uh, so, like, we did look at putting, a, like, a checked inversion of the Grafana dashboards into yeah. code. In Grafana, you can export it, I think, in JSON format. Um, mm, yeah. My feels about it are it kind of, like, makes it more complicated, it felt like it made the process more complicated for updating things. Uh, and we have had to update things along the way. Like sometimes some of these base metrics change names or sometimes like Grafana has changed things that then you have to retrospectively go back and fix in your metrics. Like you see the no data uh, in the panel. Um, but kind of does also make a lot of sense to have some sort of uh, version control checked in version of your dashboards in case your Grafana crashes. Um, you, when you save, it does version control the uh, dashboards for Grafana um, itself. But then if the, if the uh, server for Grafana would crash, I guess this, is, this information mm, is information. lost. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Unless you have some storage set up. But yeah, as an application developer, that scared me. I didn't want to do it. But luckily, we haven't gone ahead right no. now. We've talked about it, but we also haven't done it yet. So yeah, so that's possible. How difficult it is, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a little bit. Uh, that's it from Slido. So if there are questions from the audience, yeah, one moment. I would just like to add to the uh, to your answer. The, the version control thing is really helpful. Grafana does have templating mm. for dashboards. Mm. So if you have some dynamic, if you want your True. dashboard to be dynamic, like the number of application servers or stuff you have, you can add that as a variable. Look oh that yeah. variable up from Prometheus, and yeah. then from the labels, and then generate dashboards on the fly based on, on that. So that is another angle on the uh, programmatic creation of dashboards. Yeah, that's yeah. a great addition. A point. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. That's that's true. We also make advantage of that, especially do, for if you have different regions for where you're scraping your metrics from. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, we got one more. Oh, no. no it's, it's the same one. one. I have a question. Do you feel that you learned something today? No. Hopefully in this yeah. workshop. <laughs> yeah, in this workshop. <laughs> Are you going to go ahead and monitor your applications? Yeah, I'm seeing yes. nodding, hopefully, for folks at home, too. Does anyone else have any questions? Any Anything else? Yes? Perfect. So for uh, people just starting out with this, do you have a, like a short list of what are some good things to put as a, a 
metric to monitor to you know, make sure your app doesn't? Um, so just to repeat the question, uh, the question was for people who are just starting out, do you have any suggestions or like um, concrete metrics that you should like look at? Um, well, firstly, we have some resources here that you should check out. I will say um, the Prometheus documentation is a bit dense, so give yourself some time to really go through it. Um, I also think, um, you know, this is a question that we get all the time as an SRE. I get this question from a lot of the application devs, like what should we even be monitoring? Um, there's so much information that you could be looking at what is, what is even useful. So in the very beginning, we had our devs who were just kind of throwing all the information into Grafana, um, and that's okay, right? But then we had the experience of when there were outages or there were incidents, you would open up the Grafana dashboards and it would just be overloaded with information and you wouldn't be able to really see anything indicative of, of the problem. So I would firstly encourage you to think about the type of service that you have um, and think about things that make sense for your service or your application that would be helpful to you. So one example would be um, error, error rate is something that you could think about to begin with, like how many times are you actually getting errors? Um, is this expected? Um, as we looked at, status 200 is also really helpful. Grafana also enables you to put logs up into your dashboards as well, so you could have them side by side. Um, yeah, and I think that's a good starting point, just really thinking about what your service does, what you expect it to do. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool. I think we're, we technically have three minutes left, but it's also lunch, so I don't think anyone's oh, yeah. gonna complain about finishing That's slightly true. early. Feel free to come chat with us if you have a question but didn't feel comfortable to ask it in the room. Um, and yeah, go forth and monitor. Yay. Thank you, thank you very much, Vanessa. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Anna.